All right. So um, as I was saying to her uh, during the break, we have this um, up here on the website. I know I, I referenced it in one of the videos. So if you hadn't heard me say it before, there's this thing called a self-assessment template that's on here. You should hand this in with every one of your programming assignments. That way I have an opportunity to give you something better than a crappy score by you telling me your experience. All right, so this self-assessment template is has you answer several things. I wanna know how long did you spend on this assignment? Okay. I promise you, if you put down that you spent two hours on this assignment and you didn't do well on it, you're not gonna get a good grade. Okay. As a beginning programmer, this assignment is very likely gonna take you let's say 10 hours. And the amount of code you have to write is about that much. Okay. It's just very specific that much. Okay? So be prepared to budget your time and spend a lot of time on this. All right? Um, next question you answer here is, I want you to tell me based on your effort what you think you earned. Okay? Now, if you spent two hours on it, and you think that's good effort, then you, you have to adjust your expectations. Okay? Because two hours for a beginning programmer to start writing programming isn't enough. Okay? If you're trying to become a competent golfer, is the example I keep using, and you only go out and you practice for you know uh, two hours a week or something like that, and you're trying to improve greatly during a, uh, an eight-week period, right? it's not going to happen. You need to practice a lot more than that. Start building the muscle memory and working on the various mechanics, that kind of stuff. All right. Um, then I want to know, based on what you actually gave me as your solution, what did you deserve? And for most of you, for, for, for many of you, it might, might be most of you, but for many of you, there's going to be a big discrepancy between how hard you perceived you worked and what you actually handed me. Okay. You might say, look, I spent 12 hours on this. I worked my butt off. I deserve an A. What I gave you doesn't deserve points. <laughs> okay. I basically gave you nothing. This, this doesn't work. Okay. This, is, this won't even compile. Okay. This, this has 75 errors. This is the fewest number of errors I could get it to. That's possible. Okay. That doesn't mean I'm going to give you an F on it. I want to I know this last one. Provide a summary of what doesn't work in your solution along with an explanation of how you attempted to solve the problem. That's your ability to tell me about your experience, what you tried, what worked, what didn't work. You know, think about you came, came to your next golf lesson. You're trying to tell the, the coach all the stuff you worked on. It's like, well, you know, I kept hitting the ball left. So I started doing this and I started doing this. And then the coach said, okay, that's, that wasn't going to work. But now you know it won't, didn't work either, right? So very important that you, you, you put this stuff in the context that you're trying to learn a sport. Because okay? programming is like that. Okay. The assignment you're going to do this week, I'm telling you, you should spend 10 or 12 hours on this thing. You know, I'm going to come into class next week and I'm going to solve it like in 20 minutes. And that's while I'm teaching it to you. All right. So I could solve it significantly quicker if I just sat and wrote it. So it's not 12 hours worth of work. For a beginning programmer, it's going to be difficult for you. Okay. I'm going to try to give you all the tools you're going to need for it today. And then I'll give you a little bit of a kind of a nudge in the right direction. I'll try to maybe help you plan it out just a little bit. So uh, I might go through a couple of these things um, a little bit quickly and not give you too much extra explanation on some stuff since I want to make sure you have the tools available to you. And then we'll always come back and fill in some of the under how it actually works under the hood stuff later because I want you to be able to solve the, the problem for, for next week. All right. So... For when you hand this in, what you'll do is you'll just go into the uh, self-assessment template, copy it, and then when you go to your assignments and you submit your assignment, just paste that into the, 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 the box and fill it out. That way I have something to look at in conjunction with seeing your assignment. Okay. And here, just so, uh, let, let's go ahead and go through the programming assignment right now. So uh, um, we have some context for what we're going to be running into here. And I'm going to take this um, away right now. So 
we're going to be talking about methods here in a minute. So writing methods isn't that big of a deal. So we're going to, for this assignment, you're going to be writing a minimum of four different methods. The reality is you'll probably have significantly more than four. The first three of these are pretty easy. They're pretty much the same problem three times. So once you figure out the trick for the first one, the other two will be fairly easy. Okay? So I'm not saying they're easy. I mean, you're, you're going to have, they're almost like a warm up. So the very first one you tackle will be hard. You might spend, you know, two or three hours on it. But once you figure out the trick, the other two will take you 10 minutes. Right? It's not a lot of code. You just have to, you know, you're, you're working with a lot of problem solving stuff right now. So first one is print vowels. This method is going to take a string as a parameter and it should print out all of the vowels, A, E, I, O, or U, that are contained in that string one character per line. Okay, so you need to have a way of um, figuring out when looking at a single character whether or not it's a vowel. Okay. Whether or not it's an A, an E, an I, an O, or a U. In either case, upper or lower case. Print consonants. Those are the non-vowels, but are still letters. Okay? So you got several of those, but not an... In, in, in. Saying that something is a consonant doesn't mean that it's a non-vowel. Hint, hint. All right? So just because it's not A, E, I, or U doesn't mean it's a consonant. Question marks aren't A, E, I, or U, they're also not consonants. All right, so that's the exact same problem, except you're filtering out a different set of characters. Next one, print digits. This should print out only the digits that are in uh, the string, zero through nine, okay? One per line. So all three of those questions are identical to each other. Now, if you, I'll, I'll even tell you the wrong, well, I'll give you credit for it, but you're gonna, I mean, it's gonna be like horrible to write. You could write this with a bunch of if statements. If it's an A, print it out. If it's a E, print it out. I, print it out. O, print it out. U, print it out. Capital A, so and so. It's bad enough with vowels. Now let's go to the consonants. So now you're gonna have 40 if statements for all the consonants, right? Or something like that, whatever it is. And then for digits, well, you only have 10 for digits. There's probably a trick to doing it without writing 70 or 80 uh, if statements. But hey, if you can't figure out the trick, get your points, write, out, write the 70 or 80 uh, if statements, and then tell me about all the, all the things you tried. All right? But hey, I'll tell you what, those three are simple compared to the fourth one. Okay? Fourth one's horrible. Just horrible. Uh, uh, Printlin will do it automatically. Yeah, so if it was elephant, it would print out an E. Then the, then the next line, it would print out the, what's, what's the, another E, right? E-L-L-E, -L -E, so on and so forth. But system.out.println automatically presses return after it. Yeah, you, you don't have to do anything special. Yeah, the, the hard part with that one is, and if you happen to print them all out on the same line, I'm fine with that. I don't care. You know, so it's... The, 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 the real thing I'm looking for is you filtering out vowels, consonants, and digits. This last one's called process expression. So this method's going to take a string as a parameter, and I give you kind of the generic format of the string right here. Okay, and then I give you some examples of it. So it can take in a string that's just a number. It can take a string that's a number followed by a uh, either a plus, minus, times, or divide, followed by another number. Or it could be a number followed by plus minus times divide followed by another number followed by a plus minus times divide followed by another number. So it's, you know, it's a number followed by zero or more of an operator followed by a number. And then you need to do the math. But you only have to do the math using left to right arithmetic. So, for instance, you don't have to worry about that multiplication should come before addition and that stuff. That makes it way, way, way harder, all right? So for you, it doesn't matter what comes first. You're gonna say 125 is the first number. I'm gonna to add to it. The second number is a seven. So my final answer is 132. 
Uh, if this one was 125 plus 7 times 2, for example, even though multiplication should happen before addition, in your version it would not. In your version, you would do 125 plus 7, then multiply that answer by 2, given your, given your final result. Okay? But your input is a string that looks like that. You don't have numbers. You have strings. You don't even have individual numbers, potentially, if you have this expression. You have a whole bunch of characters that go together, and in chunks we have numbers, and then we sometimes have operators, and then we have numbers, and then we sometimes have operators, so on and so forth. So you're going to have to figure out how can I grab the individual numbers, the individual string representations of numbers, turn that string into the equivalent actual number. How do I turn the string 125 into the number 125? All right. And I say it in the assignment, but I'll say it again out loud here. You can only use what I've taught you in class. Okay. And next week, I'll teach you the built-in method that knows how to convert a string to a number. That means you're going to have to write your own version of that for this assignment. Okay. Just because you find it on Google and you figure out how to do it, doesn't mean you're allowed to use it. So built-in stuff, you can only use what I teach you. You can write your own version of whatever. Make sense? So I promise you, one of the first things you're going to want to write is something that takes an, a string as a parameter, just a string representation of a number, and turns that into its integer equivalent. No, no prompts. No, you, you can test it by just hard coding stuff in. And I'll show you that today. Uh, we're going to break some methods, and you'll see what I mean by testing methods with that. You don't have to prompt the user for anything. Just, you know, you'll call your process expression. You write it once. You can call it multiple times. You probably want to test it with my inputs here. So you'll call it the first time, passing at the string 125. You'll call it the second time, passing at the string 125 plus 7. You'll pass it the third time, passing at the string uh, 125 plus 7 minus 2. And you should expect the results same results I gave you here. That makes sense? Yeah, you don't have to do prompting. I mean, if you want to, you can, but I'm not teaching you how to do prompting. I won't take off if you want to use scanner to do prompting, but so I'll, I'll say that you can omit that as the you're only allowed to use the stuff we taught in class, but just, just go through the motions here. There's a reason why I want you to write the method that converts a string to a number. So that's the hard part. You might put it in your notes right now. Very first thing you should solve for part four, write a method that takes a string representation of a single number, not the whole expression, just a single number, and turns it into the equivalent int. So if it took in the number 125 as a string, it would spit out the integer 125. Solve just that problem. And that's going to be very helpful. Not the whole part of it, but that's going to be a hard part of it. And remember, you want to simplify problems down to their baby steps. Every single one of you can look at the string 125 and say, oh, that's the number 125, right? If I showed you the string that contained 1, 2, and 5, and I asked you what number does that represent, every one of you could tell me, correct? All I'm asking you to do is figure out how you were able to tell me. This goes back to the idea of we are so good at solving problems, we've forgotten how to articulate it. So you're going to have to search inside of yourself and say, how did I figure out that the string 1 followed by a 2 followed by a 5 actually represents the number 125? How did I know that? You didn't memorize every number in existence, right? Somehow you're, you're doing something there. Mm -hmm. Um, well, this guy is ultimately going to be an int, but it, it doesn't matter. If you turn that back into a string, the output will be the same. System.out.println, let me just show you here as an example. If I say system.out.println, the string 7, and I say system.out.println, the literal 7, 
it knows how to print both of those. And they'll look identical on the screen, seven and seven. Okay, so I don't necessarily care which of the outputs it is as long as it's the right number, right? I mean, it probably should be an integer if you're gonna write it the way I'm probably gonna show you in class. Um, but any way you cut it, if you're gonna do the right math, at some point they're gonna turn into integers. If they happen to turn back into a string at the end, that's, that's fine, you know, that's, you know, that's, you're so, I mean, that's, you're so far down the line that you're at 99% of the solution at that point. If you happen to want to turn it back into a string, that's, that's, that, that's fine. Um, and, and just actually to go off of that, let me show you a, a quick little trick. Um, something I said earlier is that uh, um, if you can get anything into the form of a string, uh, it's very malleable in, uh, um, so I have an integer up here, I, that I said equal to seven, right? Let me delete several of these things if you'll allow me. What if I want S to be the string version of I? I want it to be, ultimately I want it to be that. But I might not know what value I holds. In fact, let's use this to introduce methods. So when we write a method, um, methods are reusable chunks of code. We write them one time and then we use them over and over and over again. So I'm going to write a method here called uh, convert int to string. Kind of the opposite of the hard method that you're going to have to write. <laughs> All right. So for right now, you'll always put the word static in front of your methods. Don't worry about why. I'll spend plenty of time explaining it. We don't have time right now. All right. And it's not important for us at this moment. Just always start with the word static. Next thing is the return type. What kind of value is my method going to ultimately spit out? Okay, in this case, I'm going to take in an integer and I'm going to spit out a string. So this guy's return type is going to be a string. And I'll name this guy. So next thing is the name. I'm going to say convert int to string. You can name it whatever you want, but usually you want your, your method names to be somewhat descriptive of what they do. Usually they start with a lowercase letter and then use some uppercase things in there to spell it out. So what's this called, camel case? And then the next thing we have is the opening and closing parentheses. And inside of the open and closing parentheses, we have the expected inputs. So I need this guy to take in a single integer. I'm gonna pass him an integer He's going to do his magic. He's going to spit out a string. So this guy's going to take in an int. We can call it whatever we want, but whatever we name it there is how we have to reference it inside of the method. Okay. So this guy's currently screaming at me because he, he expects me to return a string and I haven't returned one yet. Okay. Now I want to take this integer and I want him to, whatever this integer holds, I have not called this method yet. This method is an untapped resource. This is the definition. So this is a method definition. I have not called it yet. So when I'm writing this, I'm writing this method generically in terms of this input that I know is of type integer, but I have no idea what value A might hold because this method is meant to be reusable. I might call it once and pass it a seven. I might call it again and pass it an 11. I might call it again and pass it a negative 217. All right, so A is gonna hold some integer value in the range of all integers, because that's what an int is. So what I wanna return here is the string version, the string representation of that uh, integer. And it just so happens that converting um, any primitive type, I'll say that for right now, converting any primitive type, that byte, short, int, long, char, float, double, boolean, converting any of those guys into strings is trivial using one super duper power tool that is so simple it's often overlooked. That's the empty string. So what I'm going to do here is we're, we're introducing this idea of string concatenation. 
So I'm going to create a string. Maybe I'll call it answer. I'm going to set answer equal to the empty. Oh, killing me this keyboard. The empty string concatenated with A. In this case, that plus sign is not the arithmetic addition symbol. Because one of the two sides of it holds a string, this guy is treated as the concatenation operator. And concatenation is a fancy way of saying glue stuff together. So I'm going to take whatever's on the left-hand side, which in this case is a string. I'm going to take whatever's on the right-hand side, which in this case is an int. And because one of those two sides, at least one of those two sides, was a string, that plus sign is treated as concatenation, which says glue those guys together. Now A is going to hold some number. And we're going to glue that some number onto the string that contains zero characters. And the result will be the string version of whatever was in A. Because I glued it onto the empty string. Does that make sense? So if A was 7, for example, this would be the empty string concatenated with 7, which would produce the string 7. I glued those two pieces together. Just the first part was a string, but it was a string that held nothing. So the empty string is very powerful for us because we can turn things into strings using the empty string without introducing any additional data to the value. Okay? So let's look at this as an example, and this will be kind of the, to answer your question about the print thing. So I stored my answer inside of this variable called answer. I didn't have to put it in a variable, but I did. Ultimately, I'm going to return that answer. Never have to do what? Uh, oh, I did. This is where I defined answer. So I said it's a type string. Its name is answer. And it's equal to the empty string concatenated with whatever A is. And again, this is the method definition. A is going to be whatever gets passed in here. But I have not called it yet. If I run this program right now, the output of the, what would the output of this program be? If I run it right now. I'll go ahead and get rid of this random thing up here. It's not going to hurt anything, but we're not using that random class anymore. If I ran this program right now, what will the output be? Okay, he says nothing. What do you think it'll be? I'm going to give you a hint. Okay, I already said it before, but bring it back up. All programs begin and end with main. So as soon as we launch this program, the very first place you go is main. What does main say to do? I, I actually got stuff on the screen. I'm not asking you to guess. What does main say I should do? Okay, so create a variable named I. Give it the value of 7. What does main say to do next? Nothing. Done. Benito. That was Urdu, by the way. Thank you. Right? Is that, is that, I don't know. That's probably not how you say done in Urdu, I'm guessing. Um, that's it. That's all this guy says do. Says to do. Create a variable and do nothing with it. The output of this program will be nothing. So I wrote a lot of crap to do nothing here, right? This method definition here, this is an untapped resource. All of you know how to, if I gave you two relatively small numbers, everyone in here could add them together and spit back the answer, right? So if I said three plus two, we could all say five. You know, there's a point where I give you too big of a number and then you got to think about it or get a calculator out or whatever. But we all have that general skill. But do you use that skill every single day? Or every single minute, every single hour, you only use it when it's called upon, correct? This is like that. So we've written this ability into our class here called driver. But we've never actually called upon that ability. We've just written it. Now let's go ahead and call upon it. Now, the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to call this method I'm going to call it in a very specific way because it's a static method, but I'm not going to spend time explaining it right now. 
So if somebody remind me next class that I need to explain the punchline of static methods, but I want to make sure I give you enough stuff, okay? So I'm going to call our method now. So I'm going to say driver dot. And notice that it gives me some options. This is the benefit of an IDE. So it says, oh, here's my convert to string method. Press enter on that. And it wants me to pass a value into that guy. So I can pass it, you know, a single integer eight if I wanted to. I can then call that method again, and I can pass it the variable i. So this is the int literal eight that I'm passing in as input. So that, ver that time through, eight will be passed into a. This guy should create the string eight and then ultimately return that string. The second time I call it, so I'm using that same ability again, but I'm passing it a different value. I'm passing it the variable i. That variable re will resolve to its value. The current value of i is seven. So seven will get passed into a. We'll concatenate seven onto the empty string, ultimately returning the string seven. Okay, what will the output of this program be? Again, remember, all programs begin and end with me. And we got a nothing yet. This guy says, create a variable named i set equal to 7. What does this line say? This guy says, call my method with this input. And this guy's going to fire out a string here. So... We're going to have a string firing out of the back of that guy, and I'm not doing anything with it. All right? So, somebody asked me to add a couple of numbers together. I'm, you know, I, 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 I don't know. I, I did it, but I didn't, I, you didn't use the answer or something like that. So, we'll see. This still does nothing. Well, it actually did plenty. It just displayed nothing. It called my convert int to string twice, but I didn't actually use the value. So let me show you a couple ways we can use the value. So it returns a string. So I can say string s is equal to that guy. And then I can say s. I can also just say system.out.println. the value directly. So this first one I'm saying store inside the variable s, so to create a variable name s of type string, so this guy's capable of holding a string, store in there the result of calling my convert it to string method, which fires out a string. So now I have that guy inside of s, then print out s. So this will print out the value of s. So what should the value of s be? The string 8. It'll just look like an 8 on the string, on the screen, but it's the string 8. We'll prove it's the string 8 in a second. All right. The second one says, print out the result of this. So one of the skills that we're going to get better at is, is reading code, being able to resolve code when we see it. That big, long chunk of code there that I have highlighted ultimately boils down to a string. It ultimately boils down to that. So this guy, given the input of i, which is currently 7, will turn into the string version of i. So at the end of the day, when that guy I have highlighted there finishes uh, running, that's what will ult ultimately be there, a 7. That's what's ultimately going to print out, is the 7. Make sense? Because so I'm printing out the result of calling that method. The previous time, I stored the result in a variable and then printed out the variable. This time, I printed out the value directly. What's the pros and cons of each of those? If I store it, I can still use it even after I print it. So I, I could print it a second time here if I want. I don't can print it out twice because I've stored it. I have it in a variable. I can use it a thousand times if I want. I can use it to, 
do some other uh, stuff, like uh, pass it into my process expression or something like that in, my, in our homework assignment. If I print it directly like this, I don't have it anywhere. I didn't store it anywhere. I got my answer, and I immediately spit it out to the screen, and now it's gone. If I want it again, i got to call the function again. Okay? So it's like saying, um, you know, when, when, you, when you type in a number, you don't write it down anywhere, and then five minutes later, you need the same number again. you got to go look it up a second, another time because you forgot it. You didn't write it down or something like that. Okay, so we'll get the same results here. Well, here, we'll get, we'll get eight twice printed to the screen, proving that we stored it, and then we'll get seven printed to the screen. So there's our eight, eight, seven. Okay, now we're actually calling upon that method. I'm calling upon that method. This is the method definition, which is an untapped resource until we actually call it. Does that make sense? In, in older languages, the answer is yes. Um, Java and most more modern languages have what's called a two-pass compiler. So when they compile the code, it goes through once and reads all the symbols. So the order of your methods doesn't matter because it already knows about them when it goes to check syntax. And then the second time through, when it hits this line, it already knows that that dude exists later on. In older languages, like uh, even the modern C compilers are written as two-pass compilers now. So like the one you saw me use earlier, GCC, you can put them in any order you want. But if you were writing C back in the 1970s, those were one-pass compilers. So you would have to write your methods in a certain order. But actually, that sometimes could create problems like chicken or the egg problem, where you might have two functions that call each other. So that introduced this concept of what's called prototyping. So what you would do is you'd write little tiny method stubs at the top, describing all your methods for the one-pass compiler, but not actually having the implementation till later on. So that's what you would often uh, often have is the, the, the a bunch of prototypes first, and then you would have uh, the implementation of each of those guys below. And that turned into something that's pretty common today called a header file. So if any of you have ever seen um, uh, uh, a C program, a lot of times you'll have something.c and then you'll have something.h. That h file, and then at the top of the C file, you'll have like a uh, hashtag include whatever the something.h was. That h file is all the prototypes. So that became the new standard is having a header file um, followed by uh, which had your prototypes in it and then the C file that actually included your prototypes at the top and then had the actual implementation of it below. That became kind of a standard. And at first you're thinking, well, why do I need two files? In some ways it's nice uh, having it like that because that header file didn't have any of the implementation in it. So even if you had 50 procedures, 50, 50 methods, um, you had 50 lines of code total. And each one was just describing what the methods were. You could put comments in there if you want to say this method does this, this method does this. So that header file kind of acted like documentation. It was at a glance, what does this dude do? And then over here, your C file, the scary looking one, actually did the doing. Does that make sense? But now we've kind of moved into a two-pass compilers became popular. Uh, C and C++, you still used header files. Once we got to Java, the header file went away. C Sharp doesn't use header files either. Objective-C did use header files. Swift, they went away. So modernly, header files are a thing of the past, although I, there's still some advantages to them. But the solution to what you're asking was, in the old days, prototypes, which then became header files which a header file, a second file versus a prototype is the same thing. So I could either prototype my 10 methods at the top of the file, or I could put them in this header file and then say include my header file at the top here. They mean the same thing. Any way you cut it, your prototype functions are going to be at the top, which are just little stubs so that the one pass compiler reads in those symbols before it gets into the other stuff so that it can actually compile your code. But as a modern programmer, we don't have to worry about it. Uh, order is not important. So with that in mind, typical convention for us right now, since I, we haven't started writing our own objects right now, we're just writing, really we're writing procedural code in an object-oriented language. 
So naming conventions typically say, well, programming conventions typically say, main go comes first, and then all your other stuff is below that. Although nothing says that's required. Basically, your class is an opening curly brace and a corresponding closing curly brace, and all your methods go inside of that. So if you think about that guy as a giant garbage bag, it's just filled up with methods. But don't put methods inside of other methods. So for instance, don't put your convert um, uh, int to string guy somewhere in the middle of this opening and closing curly brace uh, because bad things will happen. The compiler will scream at you and you'll be saying, hey, I have 200 errors, I don't understand why, and then I'll you know, say, because uh, you have a method defined in the middle of another method, it's, so keep your method separate and then call them. So this is the method definition. This is where I'm, this is where I'm describing what the method does. Here is me actually using the method. I called upon it there, I called upon it again. Does that make sense? So a method is a reusable chunk of code. Okay, so we talked about concatenation. This is gluing um, uh, uh, strings, or glu gluing one string with something else together. So concatenation is a very helpful tool. We use it pretty often. Um, let's talk about some of the other tools we have with strings. So I'm gonna give myself a string up here. String s is equal to hello world. Now all strings are able to advertise for us their length. So objects have abilities. Strings have a bunch of abilities. And next time I'm gonna show you the documentation just because I wanna make sure I get this stuff out to you. So for right now, just trust that most of the documentation is in my head. I'm gonna give you the important bits. <laughs> for, for your for your homework. Um, so one of these methods is called the length method. So if I say system dot out dot println s dot length, this is going to print out the number of characters in s, which is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So that should be an eleven. If I say string s2 is equal to elephant, and then I say s2.length there, that's going to be the length of elephant, which is 8. Okay? I didn't count that one because I've used that as an example many times. All right? So, same length method, but they're owned by different strings. So this first one will be 11, second one will be 8. Okay. Is that allowed? <coughs> you think no. Why not? Now you shook your head. You got to answer. Why not? <laughs> Why do you think that's allowed? It's okay to just say it. It just doesn't look right. Is that fair? Yeah, it it just doesn't look right. You know, we we saw us do two things up here. Where okay, I, I have a string. This is a string literal, right? And I stored inside of this variable, that string literal. And here's another string literal. I stored it inside of this variable. And so we're, we're cool with these. We saw them work, right? We're cool with those. But this one, hey, wait a minute. You're not putting that anywhere. How do you use it? Remember, variables resolve to their value. So when I say s.length here, I might as well be saying hello world.length there. This is perfectly legal. This is going to print out a four. This is going to say, I want to call the length on this string literal. Because what's happening up here is this line and this line. So these two lines right here are identical to each other. Literally identical. When this program runs, this variable s will resolve to the value it contains, which is hello world. Well, 
Um, p- potentially. I mean, that, that's that's correct. Um, the other thing we might say, look, if you can't count the characters in Hello World, why are you doing this? So um, this is probably something you wouldn't necessarily see done. But the point is it's legal to do it. Um, because usually when we have things in variables, it's going to be like in a method here where we don't know the contents of A. A is going to be something. Somebody's going to call my method and pass me something. So I want to know what is S's length. S could be hello, so it might have a length of five. S could be elephant, so it might have a length of eight. I don't know who's going to call my method, when they're going to call my method, and what they're going to pass me. That's where calling on a variable is the common case because a variable re- will resolve to its value, and by definition, variables vary in value. That makes sense? So, but the point is when we resolve a variable, so at runtime, s.length will ultimately resolve s. And in this case, we can look up a couple lines and see we know what s holds in this case. s holds hello world. If I change this to just hold hello, I don't have to change any code down here. Now s will resolve to hello because that's what the most recent value of s is. Okay? So in that case, this will boil down to 5. This will still boil down to 11. This will boil down to 8. This will boil down to 4. Make sense? So the lesson there has, uh, I mean, in this case, we're learning about the length method that strings have. So let's add that to our list of tools that strings have. I think I was. So we have a, a method here called int length that takes no parameters. All right. So this guy returns the number of characters in the calling string. That is the string that called his length method. So that's another tool we have available to us. But the lesson we're really learning here outside of the length method isn't, doesn't have anything to do with strings. It's also true for integers, right? If I have um, int i is equal to 5, and I say system.out.println i plus 3. And then I say system.out.println 5 plus 3. Those will have the same exact result. Ah, I'm about to trick you. Ready? Is this the concatenation operator or the arithmetic operator? Arithmetic, why? Mm, almost. We don't have a string on one of the sides. So if at least one of the sides was a string, so since we don't have the double quotes, whether it's just double quote, double quote, or a whole string, it could be the string hello on one of the sides, then it would be treated as the concatenation operator. But since both sides are non-strings, okay, both sides are non-strings, or if you want to look at the other way, no string is present. Um, these guys are the arithmetic. We should, we're doing addition here. So i plus 3, i resolves to its most local definition, which is 5. So at runtime, that i will turn into a 5. Now those two lines look identical, don't they? They were identical before, assuming i held 5. So variables will resolve to their value. In fact, since this guy is hard-coded to 5, this second line is actually faster because we have to take one little extra step on this first line to go and look up the value stored in i so that we can do the math for the right number. Okay, so both of those guys are going to give us our 8. Does that make sense? Okay, so more tools now. We have a method in strings that returns a char called char at that takes an integer index as a parameter. Now, strings are indexed, or what are called zero indexed. So if a string has five characters in it, if its length is five, the legal characters in it are zero to four. Let me show you this in, in action. So we'll go back up here. 
So there's my string, hello. If I say system.out.println s.charat1, this is bucket zero, this is bucket one, bucket two, bucket three, bucket four. So printing out bucket one will boil down to the char that lives at bucket one in S, which is the E. There's the E. If I change this guy to a zero, there's the H. If I change this guy to a four, that's the last legal bucket. Its length is five, but the legal buckets are zero to four. Zero to length minus one. Important fact. Length minus one is the last legal position in a string. I almost promise every one of you are going to run into an error message that looks like this. Here, here's your O real quick, just so you see it. Now I'm going to put in a five here because, oh, the length is five, so I'm going to try to access bucket five, and we're going to get an array index out of bounds exception. Because I tried to access a bucket that doesn't exist. That makes sense? So that means if I want to write a method down here, static void. So this method is not going to return a value. Instead, this method is going to display some stuff internally. All right. Kind of like your first three methods in your homework that are supposed to print some stuff. All right. So those guys should probably all have a void as the return type, which means Java makes you always advertise the return type. A return type of void says, I'm not returning anything. You still have to say it, but your intention is to not return anything. I'm going to say static void. Um, we'll say display string um, one char per line. Maybe that'll be helpful for your homework. So this guy will take a string s as a parameter. And I want to, you know, and I don't know what s is going to be. At this point, I'm writing a generic method, right? This method's going to take some string as a parameter. How long is that string? How many characters are in the string s? S dot length number of characters. If S was hello, it would be five. If S was elephant, it would be eight. Whatever S is, S dot length is the number of characters in there. Does that make sense? What are the legal buckets of S? The first legal bucket is zero. What's the last legal bucket in S? S dot length minus one. Okay, you're starting to get this whole treated as a generic thing because when we write methods, we're writing them to be reused. Okay, that's the power of the method. Okay, if we write methods with hard-coded values and then all of a sudden it's not useful for much. If your skill in your, if your addition skill in your head was only, you only had the ability to add five and two together, I mean, you'd be mostly useless except every now and then when you need to add five and two. Okay, instead you have a generic skill set where I can give you two numbers and you can add them together and give me the result. That's what we're doing here. So I might want to write a loop for example, that goes through every element of the string, printing out the character at each of those elements one at a time, or one line at a time. So how do I, how do I take, uh, for instance, I'm going to be accessing bucket zero, then accessing bucket one, then accessing bucket two. So I probably need to take a variable like an I, maybe, on a voyage where I is zero the first time, then I is one the second time, then I is two the third time. Kind of like we did for our homework for today, right? Where we went through all the numbers between one and a million. Except this time, I don't want to go one to a million. This time, I want to go zero to length minus one of that string. So for int i is equal to zero, i is less than s dot length. If you want, you can say less than or equal to s, s dot length minus one. Those mean the same thing. So i is less than s dot length. I, um, did I do plus plus on the video yet? Have you seen, have I taught you this? Not have you seen this, but um, have I taught you that? The I plus plus? Right, but did I show you the plus plus? Okay, I don't want to show it to you yet. Somebody remind me next time to teach you about the plus plus stuff because it's important to, it, it, 
it's um, more than you think it is. There's more to it than you think it is. All right? So, oh, I haven't showed you that either. <laughs> so here, we'll say i plus 1. There. Good old-fashioned incrementing. i gets the value of i plus 1. All right, so that'll add 1 to it. So this is going to take i on a voyage between 0 and s dot length minus 1, whatever that is. And each time through, I want to access the char at method at bucket i. And I want to print it. So system dot out dot print len and print ln print something and kicks it down a line. If you did not want it to kick it down a line, you would just say print. Two versions of it. One is print <laughs> len, one is just print. Print len is the one we use pretty often because usually when we're outputting, we want to output something and kick it down a line. But if you want to use print so all your stuff shows up on one line, that's fine. I don't care. Uh, so system.out.println, and we're going to print s dot char at i. Each time through here, i is going to change. The first time through the loop, i will be 0. Second time the loop, i will be 1. i will be 2. i will be 3. So on and so forth. That makes sense? This method never returns anything. It prints some stuff that's different than returning a value. Displaying stuff to the screen is not returning a value to whoever called this method. That's my root why my return type is void. So now if I say driver dot display string one char per line and I pass it S, I'm passing it hello. So this should display H, then E, then L, then L, then O. Make sense? I can pass that exact same function, a different string. Now s's length is 8, even though I didn't touch my method. The method was written generically. This will print out elephant one line at a time. Make sense? Now, um, for your, the first three parts of your homework assignment, your code's going to look pretty similar to this, except you're only going to print out if. You're going to have to wrap that guy in an if statement. You only want to print out that character if it's a vowel, or if it's a consonant, or if it's a digit. But you're going to have to maybe write some code to figure out what is a, what is a consonant, what is a vowel, what is a digit. You might write methods. Maybe a method like is consonant, which takes a char as a parameter and returns a Boolean true if it's a consonant and a Boolean false if it's not. It doesn't have to be a method. You could write it inside your code, but if you want to break things down into their baby steps, that might be one of the tools that would be ha helpful, right? If you think about this program and you say, you know, if I went to Home Depot and they had a little widget that I could throw a single character into it and it told me whether that guy was a constant or not, that might be helpful for me, or an if statement, where I could just say, if this guy's a consonant, print it, else don't, right? So you might write methods like that, break, you know, build all your little tiny tools and then use them together. All right, so that is the char at method. That makes sense? Uh, it's got scrolls. All right, so char at makes sense. Char at gets us the character at a certain position in the string. Length gets us the number of total characters in the string. Okay, the next guy. Next guy I'm going to show you. Um, go ahead. Right here? Oh, you're talking about this guy here? What what does this guy have to do with this guy? I didn't use this S. So I could delete this if I wanted to. But understand that this S has nothing to do with this S. They just happen to use the same variable name. They're in what's called a different scope. You don't have to worry about that right now, but this guy is self-contained. We're calling it from in here, but since he wasn't defined in here, these variables don't conflict with each other. Um, 
but I could have certainly called this guy string A and called this guy string S, but if I change this guy to string B, for example, now I have to change my code in here because I'm referencing a bunch of S's. All right, so you just have to make sure their variables match. Uh, under all methods. So, you know, I can't say string A equals hello and then try to call my method with S. I don't have an S there. There is no variable name S inside here. So whenever you have an opening and closing curly brace, that kind of dictates like a, a local, uh, like a, a local neighborhood, if you will. We're going to be talking about scoping rules uh, next time, but but this guy kind of indicates a like a local neighborhood. Okay, last trick here, and this one is super, super, super important for your homework assignment especially for the first three, hint, hint. We have a method that returns an int called index of that takes a char as a parameter. And what this guy does is he returns the first occurrence of whatever this character is, whatever character we pass in, the first occurrence of it in the calling string. So for elephant, if we passed in E, it would return a zero, even though E is also found at two. The first occurrence was at bucket zero. So this guy returns the position in the string, the index in the string, where the character that we pass in is first found. But doesn't remove it. Doesn't remove it. Just tells you where you can find it. Okay, so if I call, if I do this, there's hello, and I say, uh, let's go ahead and just print out a dot index of h. That guy's going to give me a zero. The first place I find an h in here is at bucket zero. Okay doesn't change the string. String is still hello. Haven't modified it at all. Just let me know that's where it's found. If I call that, if I said a.index of h again, it's going to give me a zero again. If I say give me the index of l, it's going to find this first one, which is that bucket two, not this one, which is that bucket three. So that guy gives me the two. All right. Yeah, it's, it, it, the original string is not changing. This is going to say, I'm going to look in A. I'm looking for the position of L, the first occurrence of L. That's at bucket two. This guy's saying, I'm going to look in A, which is the string hello. Where's the first occurrence of L? It's at bucket two. Yeah, it's going to be the same output. Nothing's changed. So this guy does not destroy the string in any, you know, it's, I'm just asking you to look for the same thing in the string twice. Okay, I found it in the same place I found it a second ago. Okay, but now there's a, so I've shown you the, the, the kind of the default behavior of index up, all right? Now the real power of index up, that most of you right now are going to take for granted. But I would encourage you not to take it for granted for the sake of the first three parts of your homework assignment. So what happens if it doesn't find the character? What happens if I say, what's the first index of Z in the string hello? Z's not in there. In that case, this guy returns a negative one. Very, very, very important. Because now we can use index of to determine whether something is not found in a string. <laughs> If I search for something and it gives me a negative one, it wasn't in there. You might find that helpful in your, uh, uh, you might find that very helpful in the first three questions on the homework. And also, what if we want to get the index of every element in the string? There are two elements. Right now, you don't know how to do that. You could write your own function to do that. 
but you also don't know how to do arrays yet, so how are you going to return the indexes? But it's not going to be helpful. That, that's not going to help you uh, for the assignment, um, uh, at least not yet. It, it wouldn't really help you. I think you're thinking about it to like locate the operators. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, it, I don't think it would really help you the way you're going to end up having to do it. I'll show you something next time that will do that. Yeah, I'm going to show you all sorts of cool stuff next time, and you're going to look at it and say, why didn't you give me that crap with this homework? But I'll solve it your way first, so you'll, you'll see it's possible. All right. Now, you know what? I'm feeling generous because you guys didn't get the full effect from me from last week because I was, I was sick. So I'll tell you what, because this homework assignment's challenging, I won't give you the paper this week. Just the program. Right. Sound fair? Because I did feel bad. I, you, know, you still had most of the lecture, but you didn't get you know, the real deal, right? Okay. And I am warning you, the assignment is challenging. So go in with your eyes open, plan your, you know, plan your time. But you know, now you don't have that paper also to worry about uh, um, to also fit into that time. Sound fair? I encourage you to work in groups. I encourage you to ask questions. Let me just uh, glance at the homework one last time here. Make sure I have given you everything you're going to need for it. Um, let's see. Today is the 8th, so this guy is due on the 15th, 6 p.m. Okay. So we're going to walk through that. Uh, here's a hint, um, as you might write this down, remember you can use the double equal sign, the equivalence operator for comparing primitive types. So you can certainly say, is this char, the char I'm currently looking at is char at bucket three, is that guy equivalent to a space? Single quote, space, single quote. All right, that's going to help you deal with ignoring things like the space between the five and the plus sign. Does that make sense? Okay, so I'll walk through that. Grab, convert. Okay, I think you have everything you need to do it. Um, only thing I can encourage you to do, uh, obviously put the time in, but break things down into tiny little baby steps. Don't try to solve too big of a problem at once. If the problem you're currently thinking about can be broken down into two pieces, do it. Then deal with each of those pieces. If this problem can be broken down into two pieces, do it. You might get to the point where you're doing something just so trivial in a little method, but that will benefit you right now because your natural inclination for this is to look at the problem and say, how the heck am I supposed to do this? Because you're thinking about that. Instead of this, then this, then this, then this, then this, and then saying, oh, I have all these tools laying in front of me. If I just use this guy with this guy with this guy, I get this. Well, if I have that, now I can put it with this and I get this. There's my final answer. Make sense? All right, questions, comments, concerns, bribes. All right, I will see everybody next Wednesday.